morning, everyone, and welcome to the session. Welcome to our session on... I'm going to just give a moment for people to settle down. Okay, mo morning everyone. My name is Mike Webster. Uh, this is supposed to come through on channel one. Uh, this is quite an innovative room. I, it's the first time I've experienced it. It's called a silent room. So the mic is actually not projecting to uh, the room. It's actually all going through the headset. So you all need to have uh, a headset and you key into channel one. If you don't have a headset, you need to get one upstairs. All of the audio is going to be through here. We do have a lot of people online, and because it's, a, uh, it's just a curtain between us and the next room, we can't use a lot of sound, so it's all happening through here. Welcome to Paddy's for the Planet. Sorry about the delay, um, but we're here now, and uh, we're going to have an exciting session. This is about tackling the water climate challenges through low-carbon rice. This is an issue of great importance to many of us here. As mentioned, my name is Mike Webster. I work for the World Bank. I'm the program manager for the 2030 Water Resources Group. And, and I've got the pleasure of um, moderating this session. Uh, before taking much time, I want to introduce my boss, Saroj Kumar Jha, who is the senior, the, the global director of water at the World Bank Group. Uh, he's going to do the opening remarks, after which we'll go to two moderated panels, one on incentives for different stakeholders to practice efficient irrigation systems, and the second on perspectives on innovation and financing. While Saroj is coming up, I also want to acknowledge the Deputy Minister from South Africa, from the Department of Water and Sanitation. Welcome, Minister. Great to have you here, uh, and to the other dignitaries in the room. Thanks very much. Over to you, Saroj. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I really want to thank all the organizers of this uh, very important session, Paddy for Planets, um, because in the broader context of uh, the whole world trying to cope with climate crisis, there is growing realization that the existing agricultural practices in many countries, or most countries in the world, are adding to the overall emission, which till recently many of us felt it was primarily coming from the fossil fuel, not realizing that the agriculture sector was also adding to the overall emission, and therefore it needed very serious attention. I'll try to frame my remarks in the context of how the World Bank is trying to engage and uh, a new initiative that has been launched recently. So I come from a rice growing region in India and, uh, and I know that uh, many countries in the world, particularly in South Asia, East Asia, but also in Latin America, Africa, uh, they grow paddy and paddy is life, is a lifeline for peop many, many millions of people around the world and therefore, uh, how we can essentially move towards decarbonizing paddy cultivation, but more broadly to decarbonize agriculture sector is very much part of an effort in which the World Bank is engaged. And I know many of you who are involved in organizing this event, we're also working with you. In fact, one of the uh, reports that the World Bank will be launching in the coming months, it is uh, on decarbonizing agriculture. And this is going to look at not just paddy, but also going to look at many other uh, things which are happening in the agriculture sector, which needs very serious attention. 
But coming back to Paddy and in terms of how we are looking at it, um, first, just in terms of broad numbers, and many of you in this room know the numbers better than you know, I know, but so roughly the uh, Paddy has grown in about 200 million hectares in the world. And there are 10 countries in the world which are kind of uh, responsible for almost 70% of uh, rice production. The reason I'm giving you this number is that if we really want to focus on growing paddy in a sustainable manner, we could try and have a very focused approach in those on those 10 countries, which is pretty much responsible for one 30 million hectares out of total 200 million hectares where paddy is grown. And if you, we can work with those 10 governments, private sector, civil society, farmers organizations, we can really make a huge impact. And this is exactly what the Paddy for Planet program for the World Bank, it means. And you can list the country. This is India, China, Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Cambodia, Laos, Bangladesh, Pakistan, I think it's also Nigeria is number 10 or 11. But these are the countries which are really in the top 10. I may have missed one or two here, but what I'm trying to say is that when it comes to tackling this problem, we are essentially looking at a small group of countries that we need, need to build very strong partnership to take this work forward. These 10 countries are also responsible for almost 90% of total methane produced in paddy cultivation in the world which means that if we are able to work with these 10 countries, uh, we can really significantly, not on, not on my statement, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> A bit of humor is important because I went twice up and down on this. I look at my weight and 100 kilos going up and down twice. <laughs> it's not easy. So those 10 countries, 90% methane reduction, which is about 10% of the total methane produced globally. So this is a very significant impact we can make by really trying to focus on this program. And as part of that, we want to work with the private sector in these countries. Uh, Mike mentioned about the the flagship program of the 2030 WRG, in which many of you are involved, in India and in Uttar Pradesh, uh, which is, of course, a state in India, but it's a very large country where we have extensive program under the UP Water Accelerator, where precisely we are looking at working with a very large group of farmers trying to focus on water saving and low methane in, in the way paddy is cultivated. But of course, it is also looking at using micro-irrigation schemes for more efficient uh, water resource management. But in addition, uh, they, we have uh, recently approved large programs in China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, some under preparation, some already approved by our board of directors, which primarily support the governments to establish large programs for decarbonizing paddy cultivation. And this is moving away from continuous flooding to mid-season drying or to alternate wetting and drying, AWD as it is called, in many of the countries. In some other countries, DSR, which is direct seeded rice, is also being tried. So we are looking at various means of uh, encouraging decarbonizing paddy sector. And our program of support to the governments will look at not just improving irrigation and drainage services, but also creating incentives for farmers to adopt new practices, helping governments to develop MRV, measurement, reporting, and verification systems so that we know how the emissions are being reduced in these countries. Massive investment in the research and development in this sector will also be part of our support. And of course, we want to do this in a collaborative manner with the private sector. So thank you very much uh, for the session. And uh, I look forward to the discussion. This is a very important part of the World Bank's uh, water program. And you will hear more about our program of support. If there's any government listening to my statement now and would like to seek help in establishing a program for decarbonizing their agriculture sector, please get in touch with the World Bank's country director in your country, 
And trust me, we will be more than happy to really work with you and mobilize the technical organizations and the private sector to really support uh, this agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saroj, for opening for us and for those inspiring words. You heard the remark at the end, we're open for business. We want to help countries decarbonize their agriculture, not just on paddy, but on all agriculture irrigation that is of significance to your country. We now move into the panel discussion, and it's my pleasure to, to welcome the first panel. This panel is moderated by Ole Sander, Ole is a senior scientist and climate change focal point at the International Rice Research Institute, and he will lead uh, the first panel and call the, uh, uh, the various panelists on stage. Over to you, Ole. Thank you very much, Mike, for the kind introduction and uh, for the invitation as a moderator of this first panel interview. Welcome, everyone, to this discussion. Um, let me introduce the three panelists for this first discussion. Um, first of all, I'm very honored that uh, Judith Chabalala is with us, the Deputy Minister for Water and Sanitation of the Government of South Africa. Welcome. The second panel member is uh, Adrian Sim, the CEO of the Alliance for Water Stewardship and also board member of the Sustainable Rice Platform. Welcome, thanks for joining. And our third panel member is Jessica Christensen, the Vice President of Sustainability and Business Stewardship for Bayer Crop Science. Thank you for joining us today. Um, could you just change positions? Oh, sure. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, let me. So I would. I would like to have this this panel as interactive as possible. So I will give an opportunity to people here in the room, but also people online to ask questions. But I would like to start first uh, with. Uh, a few introductory questions to the panel members myself. And it's actually a, a pleasure to be in this moderating role today. Usually I'm the one who has to ask all the questions, so I'm very happy that I can pose some questions today. Um, Ms. Jabalala, Your Excellency, um, can you, you're working in the Ministry uh, for Water in South Africa, can you describe um, what the ministry is doing in terms of balancing the demands of the different sectors um, and maybe with a particular focus on agriculture. What are your challenges that you're facing? All right. Uh, thank you so much. Do you hear me? Is it, is it open? What's the situation? I you, think you it's do? open. Oh, maybe it's because of the other <laughs> side. But thank you so much and a good, obviously, morning to everybody here. Look, agriculture is quite um, a big sector in our country. As you know, we do have rural areas um, wherein there's lots of uh, land that we have in our country. However, as a ministry for water resources, we are also managed in an integrated manner uh, to ensure the sustainability of lives, the livelihoods and overall development goals um, of the country. And we do have a collective effort uh, where we improve water use efficiencies from various water users and um, of obviously uh, water economies. So agriculture, which is the biggest consumer of water, uh, the industry, the mining and domestic use significantly contributes to us the overall water availability. So reducing the pressure of the system the reduction of water and use of inefficiencies in mining sector through the reuse wastewater has been more allocations towards the local communities, uh, basically, uh, but also our department strategies that we employ, uh, they express the importance. Um, and I implemented through the Nexus approach, the uh, nature-based solutions, the lands where possible,
for the efforts to reduce the competing um, uses while we also ensure that uh, the sustainability growing and security of our water resources. So yeah, that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this overview. Um, and then moving a bit closer to rice, as the uh, session is called, uh, Paddies for the Planet, Adrian. And maybe before we move there, to the audience who may not uh, all be aware, the, the reason why we're talking about water uh, and irrigation and rice and uh, greenhouse gas emissions is that uh, paddies, rice paddies, are a big emitter of methane. And this methane is produced by bacteria in the soil which grow in anaerobic conditions under flooded conditions. So if there's a standing water layer, this meth methane is being produced by bacteria and with uh, reduced irrigation, like a mid-season drainage, as was mentioned, or alternate wetting and drying, uh, we can reduce also not only the water consumption, but also uh, methane emissions. So that's why we're talking about that hand in hand. Now, Adrian, um, which water efficient practices uh, do you see as most promising and which ones are particularly relevant for um, saving water and uh, low carbon rice production? Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be here with, with a, a two hats on. Uh, I'm a, a board member of the Sustainable Rice Platform uh, and I'm also chief executive of a a water-focused organization, the Alliance for Water Stewardship. And what these two organizations have in common is we are both voluntary sustainability standards. So the remarks I am going to give are not from the perspective of a rice expert, uh, but from somebody who is um, deeply involved in, in sustainability standards and also deeply convinced of the value that, that sustainability standards can bring in connecting the different stakeholders, in particular the private sector with uh, communities and with public sector priorities. Um, and it's a, the ability of standards to, to um, enable us to take a holistic and systemic perspective, uh, which is, I think, the, the point I would like to emphasize rather than any particular uh, technology for, for efficient, driving efficiency in, in rice production. In particular, standards like, like the Sustainable Rice Platform um, has eight, th the SRP standard has eight themes of which water use is one, uh, but any standard needs to be um, applied in a given context and for any in intervention on efficiency to be effective, it also needs to be to, to speak to that, that context. Um, so rather than prescribing specific technologies, standards help us to understand all the other factors that are relevant for any intervention to be effective and would view water use efficiency not as an end in itself, uh, but as a means to achieve more sustainable and durably sustainable uh, rice production. Um, and I think that's consistent with the many the many other examples that exist of, of where efficiency-focused interventions in, Af in, in agriculture have not been as effective as they need to be because they haven't been accompanied by the policy framework or the technical assistance or the finance that is needed for those interventions to be effective in the long term. So bringing, using sustainability standards to to bring the stakeholders together to understand the totality of the context in which any intervention is being placed is a really important uh, sort of soft value that, that can be provided. Mm -hmm. Can I just um, clarify, so water saving in that case would be uh, the goal, and but it's not just achieved with the technology itself, but it needs this enabling environment. Is that what you're... I, I would say water saving may be the goal. Sustain the, 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 the sustainability of rice cultivation would be ultimately yeah. the goal. And in many contexts, the, becoming more water use efficient will be an important yeah. aspect, important <laughs> step in achieving that goal. 
but water use efficiency wouldn't be the goal, the end mm -hmm. in itself. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Jessica, let me bring you into the conversation. Um, can you give us an overview of what uh, Bayer Crop Science sees as most promising water saving options in rice? Um, and maybe also how, in your view, we can, we can incentivize producers to adopt those. Yeah, thank you, and um, pleasure to be here with my esteemed colleagues and partners, because that's what it's going to take, right, is a lot of collaboration. So um, we've heard a lot about rice and why rice, but to give some more perspective to that, you know, there's estimates that there's going to be over 10 billion people by 2050, which would, it, would, would require an increase of about 25% in rice production, just to sort of maintain Uh, that calorie and nutritional security uh, that millions of people rely on. So how, how are we going to do that? The transplanted rice cropping system is not going to be viable and sustainable in the long term. And I think there's been lots of comments towards that. So at Bayer Crop Science, we're really focused on, as Adrian said, how do we work in, these, in the partnership models to really enable farmers to think about agronomic practice changes of the whole system? So we at Bayer, when it comes to water, we have a lot of goals in our own operations, but that's not good enough for us. We really want to go beyond that to have more scale and impact. And we have that opportunity because of our farmer customers. If you think about agriculture as a whole, yeah, it has environmental impact. Certainly, there is this nexus of food production and, and planetary boundaries, But we have a huge opportunity to use agriculture as a lever in solutions towards these challenges as well. So for rice in particular, we're focused on direct seeded rice as one system, and that's going to take a lot of cultural changes. We think technology is there um, across the board from our seeds and, and crop protection and inputs to mechanization to um, fertility management to agronomic advice and services with digital tools to enable this. So within that system, uh, that en enables water savings of up to 40%. So if you think about the, the water withdrawals, about a third of global fresh water is utilized for rice production today. So it's a huge opportunity to impact at scale. So with this system, you're really impacting water savings. So it's a, a crop per drop mentality. So it's a water use efficiency play. You're helping with greenhouse gas emissions. You're also helping improve the livelihoods of millions of smallholder farmers and communities. Um, so it's really the system's approach. Um, the, the big commitment that we've made, so externally we have commitments around greenhouse gas reductions, environmental impact reductions, which is around our crop protection portfolio, um, 100 million smallholder farmers, so improving 100 million smallholder farmers' livelihoods. And in addition, in March of 23 at the UN Water Conference, we made a water commitment. So we realized the importance of really focusing on more resilient um, cropping systems in water scarce regions in particular. So we're starting with rice, which we have committed to um, reduce the amount of water used by 25% by 30, 2030 per kg of rice crop produced. So it's a water use efficiency metric um, and, and the smallholder areas where, where Bayer participates. So it's a pleasure to be here because in, in order to enable that, you're going to have to have a lot of cooperation. That's a lot of cultural practice changes. So it's going to be really important to, to innovate together. Thanks, Jessica. Let me just pose one follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you mentioned the, the importance of large scale mm -hmm. Uh, impact and that needs large scale adoption. So, how can we incentivize? What, what does yeah. Bayer Crop Science do to support in, incentivizing yeah. these, these practices? And it's a great, great question. I think a lot of us philosophically agree, right, on the things we need to tackle, but then how do you actually execute it, right? So, one example we're starting in India as one of the major, I think it's the second <coughs> leading uh, uh, rice produ production co uh, country, and we have a program called Direct Acres. And so we're linking our water goal to this program. So it's really about offering farmers incentives, um, either cash incentives or uh, inputs or other advice. So it's really linking together the whole system for them to, number one, make it easier for them to learn these new practices, but also to make it economically viable for them uh, during the transition. The other thing we're doing is we have a uh, carbon program 
So we are partnering with, um, with Gen Zero, as well as Shell India and Bear to basically pay growers for these better practices. So they get an incentive per hectare if they change their practices. So we have a couple different models where we're trying to make them more economically mm -hmm. viable. Is that sustainable to pay uh, farmers for uh, applying sustainable practices? It is in the beginning. Mm -hmm. The goal, though, is that with these changes in practice, that they become more productive. So as the soil health increases, as the agronomic knowledge gets there, as the inputs get, get better, it should be able to produce, they should be able to produce more crop that, and, and sort of maintain that viability long term. Mm -hmm. But in the short okay. term, we do have to bridge the change. Thank, me. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me just directly uh, go to Ms. Chabalala, um, because we're talking about incentives. Yeah. So what, what can governments, policymakers uh, do to create incentives for, for adoption of water efficient uh, irrigation? Uh, and if you have some examples, please. Please share right. that with us. Thank you so much for the question. I think it's quite important. And taking from what uh, the response came, just your last point, is it mm -hmm. a good thing to put money on it? Uh, just to put it simply, uh, good and well, uh, but at some point it it has to yield the results. It's like you're paying somebody to go and do their job. Um, uh, but for me, it would have to have other incentives as well that we look into that are more educational and more skills-based so that they are sustainable. Uh, but uh, from our government, and I think uh, as policymakers, we can make towards the wider adoption of water efficient irrigation practices that are through restructuring, because we need to restructure uh, the relevant policies. Um, uh, obviously, since you asked that question, uh, that is really geared uh, towards the uh, driving the promotion of water saving practices. Because at the end of the day, it's about how to we then save water, but we also uh, maximize in terms of what is the output that we want to gain out of it. But while we're putting in place the necessary financing instruments, because you do need the financing instruments, and I think that such as subsidy, the funding models should be there um, as part of financing, because we can speak all these things. If there isn't, there is always lack of financing becomes an impediment. But we also need to make make available the technology. And I think that's very critical. The technology, the reduction of taxes and duties as part of uh, the incentives on water saving inputs and also the outputs. But providing the necessary learning, as I said, platforms and advisory support, so you are able to also give the necessary support that you require, mm -hmm. but furthermore, scaling this throughout the value chain mm -hmm. in terms of creating those incentives for investments and adoption and including the supporting the water user associations. I think that we need to also support the water user associations so that it can also be that partner that we need. That's, that's also your applause. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> let me <laughs> yeah. let let me emphasize one point that you mentioned that I think is very important. That's really investing in the people, yeah. uh, investing in in skills, investing in capacity. So I think that's that's a very important point that we often forget when we just talk about uh, technology dissemination. Yeah. Um, let me maybe ask the audience if there are any questions now. Uh, and also, I see a hand up there, and also online, if someone monitors that. So we see, I see a hand up over there. Can we get a mic there? Yes, coming. Thank you. Can you please identify yourself? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. I'm Apurva Oza from the Aga Khan Foundation. So uh, we work a lot on rice in India and Madagascar and all these countries. So two questions. Uh, uh, SRI was promoted um, in a big way in India and um, uh, in many other countries, and and uh, and we all know the work which has been done on that. So does SRI fit? Uh, is it? I know there are differences with uh, direct rice seeding, but from an extension point of view, we found SRI farmers are much more willing to take up SRI than they are willing to take up DSR, uh, so to say. That is one issue. 
and I wanted your views on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, second issue is how do you, uh, you know, and uh, that's a question that initially if you give an incentive, uh, there have been many projects in India by the government where incentives have been given, but then farmers revert back to original practices when the incentives are not there. Because largely, mm -hmm. the perception is that the labor costs, uh, you know, seed costs go down, water costs go down, but labor cost and peak labor costs go up when you practice DSR. And that's a, that's a factor which, you know, makes farmers hesitate. So how do you address that? Sorry, can I ask, you, you mentioned the labor cost goes up when you practice DSR? Sorry? The, you, you said the labor cost goes up when you practice DSR? That is what farmers okay. perceive. Uh, all right. That there is a, I mean, I, uh, we have done the calculation, not overall, but at a period of time, in an initial period, the labor costs are slightly higher. Okay, the labor costs should go down, in my view, but yeah. if that's the perception, <laughs> um, I think that's a question to, to Jessica and Adrian, maybe. Yeah, Adrian, do you want to start with this? Uh, goodness, I'm, I'm considerably out of my depth. I'd like to emphasise the <laughs> the fact I'm not a rice expert, so I wouldn't necessarily have anything to to say specifically to these to these uh, technologies or, or methods for cultivating rice. I guess more broadly on the incentives piece and the the durability of of, of any incentive scheme. Um, I've been encouraged just by this conversation by the fact we have input providers from Bayer, we have the government. Uh, perspective, um, educational perspective. One perspective that perhaps is not there is a, is, is a market perspective, yeah. um, which can be very powerful. Um, and so the, the providing incentives for traders mm -hmm. to demand sustainably cultivated rice is, mm -hmm. is, is another key part of, of the mm -hmm. equation. So that it needs, again, yeah. my, my mantra of it needs a, a holistic <laughs> perspective. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, Jessica may yeah, have... Uh, I, can, I can touch on a couple yes, of that, because great, great questions and comments, by the way. So um, there are multiple... So we talked about alternate wetting drying. That's part of our car carbon program, too. So it's not just about direct seeded rice, because we agree we need to have flexibility, depending on the local and, and the, that particular smallholder producer, even. So... We are promoting different practices around alternate wetting drying and then all the way to a DSR system. Within the DSR system, um, to your point on the, the cost piece, uh, what we're working on would say that it's actually gonna be lower. So this is, uh, to Ola's point, we, and it needs to be, right, to make this actually live and be, be taken up and, and adopted by farmers. So we're working with, you know, what does mechanization mean in smallholders, stop trying to make it like a, a lustered uh, uh, mechanization. We're not talking. So I think the mechanization pieces are much different now. So working with those uh, providers, the input providers, the off takers. To to Adrian's point, is another important component of this. But when we're doing the math, because we're absolutely doing the same thing, is what's the return on investment to a grower? And working with several growers and our pilots to get direct feedback from them about what's mm. working and not. The economics in our model show that direct seeded rice actually is, is more cost effective than transplanted, predominantly because of the labor situation, as you mentioned, not having enough people to work on the nurseries and then the timing of very delicate timing of when you have to then actually go in from nursery to the fields and the patties to, to transplant, right? So because of that, and I think the pandemic, the COVID pandemic exacerbated the labor cost. So timing wise it works. But your point is very valid because there's perception. DSR is not new, as you guys know, that have worked in rice. So what's changed to enable that? The education, the capacity building, the knowledge transfer, we're working on all those components because it's not just about us launching new innovation and, and saying, okay, it's great, here you go. Um, so we are working on what's that whole agronomic system and the training. Mm. That's the, where the incentives come yeah. in, is yeah. really around the training components. And then I think we have to make it viable because I agree um, that we can't continue to, to um, supplement forever, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to make it more viable if we actually want to get to scale. But really good points. No, I think that's an that's a, that's a important point, or two, two important points. Um, one is, is definitely... Uh, the mechanization aspect, and that may also yeah. trigger that question. With with uh, mechanization investment into agricultural development, in that as in that case, 
uh, the labor uh, costs uh, would also go down. And then it's also uh, a lower risk of switching back to practices that are more labor intensive. We need to ensure, though, that those mechanized practices are really right. uh, more sustainable than the traditional right. practices. And that's, uh, that's of course, a, uh, has different, different, different aspects to it. Um, I, I heard that we have online questions. Maybe we can take one or two now, Alida. Yes. Um, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. So there is a question for um, the Deputy Minister. Uh, from Meghna Raupalajani, who is saying, thank you for sharing your strategy on water management. Does your country align the efficiency goals in water with your climate ambitions as well? And what is your advice on this for maybe other nations looking for leadership in blending water and climate goals? Do right. you get the question? I, I think I got it. <laughs> I'll try my best. Uh, thank you so much for the questions uh, from online. Of course, our country does uh, share, uh, I mean, we do have the Res Water Research Commission, and we're working a lot around issues of climate change to ensure that we align our policies around that. Um, and you, you, the, on that question, for me, it says that what is it that we're also doing to ensure that this water use, and we use it sparingly. And we do have what we call the Water Act, and this is what I can share with other countries in terms of legislative reform. Uh, we have the Water Act of 36, 1998. Uh, for me, it is a good example uh, of a legal framework that really provides for the effective and sustainable management of our country's water resources. And the Act really uh, requires that the country water resources be used efficiently and equitably uh, in a sustainable manner for the benefit of the all. So it should not only be for a certain few it should be in a position where it's for the entire, for everybody and all the sectors where the water is quite needed. Furthermore, as South Africa as well, we have developed and implemented the water administrative system, uh, uh, which is an integrated management tool for irrigation schemes uh, that deliver water on demand through the canal networks, the pipelines, the rivers, water administration systems. Um, we also, I mean, it goes to a point where we cover over 190,000 um, at, at this point hectares um, and also resulted in about 55 million cubic meters away in per area of water savings. So that is a typical example of exactly what we're doing to cover that. But I hope that I've answered the question. If I didn't, they can always come back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, a second question, Alida. A second question from Maeve Hall. Uh, the second question is, what role does digital and automation play in the initiatives that um, are being proposed for rice production? And what are the incentives in any toolkits that be can be used really for adoption? That's oh. probably uh, for yeah. Jessica. Yeah. Yeah, Jessica. I can start on that one. Mm -hmm. So um, digital and data are, are absolutely critical. So thank you for the question and the comment. Um, we are working on uh, platforms. So we have a, a platform called FarmRise, which is really gonna be what we're gonna utilize for our smallholder farmers. So it'll be for the rice system in particular, where we're gonna have a lot of data that comes in from other pieces of the system, not all our own data. So the data consolidation is 100% is critical. So to be able to calculate, to be able to, to be transparent, to have verification, and that's a, that's a concern for everybody. The other piece, so how do you get the data? Uh, if you're talking about over 150 million smallholder farmers that produce rice, I think up to 200 million, how are you gonna do that? You can't send people to 150 million one hectare farms. Yeah. So we're working with different um, innovation companies around scaling, so remote sensing, satellite imagery, um, there's more sophisticated water meters, for example. But we're looking at it as a, at a, as a whole system approach. So we're tracking um, greenhouse gases, we're tracking water, um, and then the economic viability piece to our smallholder kind of community goals. So automation is going to be critical. How you calculate what's the right sample size, making sure innovation is validated and accepted by everybody from governments and policymakers to farmers. Making it simple for farmers is the key to adoption. Simple and profitable. So anything we can do that helps with automating data pieces and collecting, you know, uh, connecting them to off takers to um, they will adopt so that would be my, my simple ask 
for those that are listening that are in this space, please reach out. So this is a big collaboration area that I think um, across public private, mm -hmm. we need to really, really align on. I think we all agree on that. And, and that brings me also to another point of, uh, so collaboration has been mentioned many times, collective uh, action. And especially if you want to uh, upscale uh, effective irrigation management on a large, larger scale, catchment mm -hmm. scale, uh, it is important uh, that, that we apply some collective, collective action. However, that's more and more contested. I mean, we have climate change that drives water scarcity in, in many areas. We have uh, simple um, geopolitical uh, issues. So, Adrian, um, what are some key enablers of uh, collective water management? So, first of all, um, I would say it's not the collective action that's contested. Many of the issues around water use and the escalating climate challenges, of course, there's a lot of um, a, a lot of disagreement there, but um, I think everybody's up for collective action. Um, and um, certainly the organization that I lead is, is that's what, what we are all about in, in the space of water, as are many others. And so there's a whole load of existing initiatives to um, to engage in, including the 2030 Water Resources Group. Um, so I would say, the, the, the first, first of all, the, the enablers of collective action are, are pretty much there. Now, th these, in, in the sense of, of platforms and initiatives, these need things to do, action to take collectively. Uh, but again, many of, 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 of the, the, the tools um, technologies, approaches that would be adopted in a collective action effort, they already exist. So I guess my my plea is is utilize. And we're here at a rice session. I'm a I'm I'm, I'm more of a water water specific perspective, regardless of how, where that water is used. There's so much uh, availability of of resources to drive collective action in rice or elsewhere. <laughs> The, but the approach is really important, and I'm going to I'm going to plagiarise somebody who I, I heard speaking at a session on this just yesterday, who was saying the mindset needs to change from what can I bring a sort of push mindset, what can I bring to this, to what is needed here, and how can I contribute to that, and that's a subtle but I think very important. Um, shift in how, how we approach things and how we approach things matters because that determines who's involved, how they're involved, how the power dynamics are played and collective action is ultimately a political thing. Mm -hmm. So we need, to, we need to approach it in a way which uh, builds trust, builds confidence uh, and, and uh, through that the durability of the approach. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Erin. I mean, I, I question a little bit if really everybody is up for collective action or if they're not some actors that are more uh, acting towards themselves uh, and alone. But Name I, one. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I'm, 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 general, I'm generalizing, but in, in the sense of, of is there a recognition that the issues that we're talking about here today are far greater than any one organization or, or group can... can address yes there's consensus on that is a consensus that we need cross-sectoral engagement to to deal with these yes there is the, the contested stuff it comes in the detail of, of exactly how and when and, and things that's okay. that's true would you like to comment on that mr yes, Ola, no, please I, yeah uh, i think the most important tools that you need uh, firstly you need and i think i'm going to put it on the you need the people you need the people, uh, that's the first, um, I think, that you need to invest in the people. So we keep on talking about the farmers. Where are the farm workers in what we're speaking about? Because the investment of this technology, at the end of the day, it's them that needs to be in a position to also use that. Part of the tools, you also need research and development. It's quite important. Marketing is quite important. The right uh, 
pricing uh, is important. But the stakeholders that you're talking about, this should be more for a social compact, where you've got all the partners, all the players. I hear what you're saying, what you're saying is that other people don't want to get involved. They have to be persuaded to get involved. And I think that uh, you know the multi-stakeholder action is quite critical, where you have mobilized from farmers uh, along private sector, it's very, very crucial for you to have the private sector and government actors to work together. In my country, we call it private-public partnership. And, and if you enhance that, it's quite, it will yield the results. Ultimately, what you're looking for, the restructuring of, of the policies that I spoke about earlier, it's quite crucial. Financing. Financing, 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 and uh, the available uh, technology is quite critical. But you have to get the whole stakeholder, but you have to have the social compact for all the partners that needs to be involved for you to make sure that it works. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. I couldn't have summarized it better. And uh, that unfortunately brings us to the end uh, of our session, but I think that was a perfect uh, closure remarks for this panel. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, for attending this this panel and this discussion. Um, if you have additional questions after the session, after 1 a.m. Uh, 1 p.m., uh, you may approach uh, some of the panelists and ask directly. I'm sorry that we had limited time now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And over to Mike. Thank you very much, uh, Ole, and, and thanks again to the uh, Honourable Minister for, for gracing us with your presence and for that uh, stimulating panel discussion. Lots to think about, lots to chew on. We have the second panel uh, for the second half. Uh, we will end by one, so this is another 45 minutes. This is on perspectives on innovations and financing, and this panel will be moder moderated by Carolina Garcia, and Carolina is the Global Sustainability and Innovation Director at uh, AB InBev. Over to you, Carolina. Thank you, Mike, and good afternoon to all of you. This is the first time that I'm also doing this silent format, so very interesting. As a, and also, I'm an innovation enthusiast, so I'm very excited to be moderating this panel here with you. And we have really interesting speakers with us today, so I'm going to invite them uh, to join me here uh, on the stage. Uh, and first, uh, if we can welcome Madhu Rajesh, who is the Senior Director of Water and Agriculture at the Coca-Cola Company. Welcome, Madhu. Uh, also, Richard Kolbach, the Global Platform Lead of Crop Production for the IFC. And last but not least, Alok Sika, the India Country Representative of the International Water Management Institute. And let's welcome them with a round of applause. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, Richard, you can either take this mic or share that mic with a log. We're in that collective action sharing space, so however you prefer. Wonderful. So now that we're all set, um, I wanted to quickly start with you, Madhu. And I know that in the previous panel, um, our other colleagues talked about this in depth, but perhaps you can set up the talk um, mentioning why it's so important to talk about water irriga irrigation in the context of agricultural production and perhaps refer both to the environmental and social benefits. Thank you so much, Caroline, and thank you for having me here today. I know the core uh, topic of the panel is around paddy, and that's not um, an ingredient that we work with, but I'm here to talk about um, the topic in a more general context across a range of agricultural settings and commodities. So for the Coca-Cola company, our main ingredient is water, 
and we uh, we realize that uh, the vast majority of our water footprint actually comes from the crops, the ingredients that we use in our products, whether that's sugarcane or mangoes or um, other commodities. And so water has been core to our work for well over a decade now. Um, and the Coca-Cola Foundation, as well as the company and our franchise bottling system, have a long history of working with uh, a number of projects in agricultural contexts. And so I um, wanted to just share some of the key learnings as, as you've asked around climate and, um, and the social context. Very often, when you talk about water in agricultural settings, the, the conversation tends to be around irrigation and uh, purely a focus on water use efficiency or access to water. But like we heard in the previous panel, uh, a lot of the practices that are used to promote irrigation efficiency um, have broader benefits, whether they are around soil health or they're around carbon, uh, carbon sequestration, improvements in yield, um, and therefore an improvement in farm profitability, production and costs, et cetera. So that interconnection is, uh, is quite important to understand and design better programs that address multiple sustainability goals. From the work that we've seen, uh, a number of the practices are the same, whether they're intercropping, cover crops, looking at uh, more uh, organic fertilizers, compost, um, and that, that stays the same across a number of uh, projects or even zero till farming or reduced tillage, et cetera. So they're, they're very similar and consistent and yield benefits. So I, I'd just like to share some examples that we've seen across different commodities and across the globe. Um, in South Africa, the Coca-Cola Foundation supported a project in Eastern Cape that worked with local farming communities and looked at the use of cover crops and uh, biochar as use of fertilizer. Um, and we found that um, it helped improve the soil's water holding capacity. And you know, we know when soil is rich in or organic matter, it becomes like a sponge, so it absorbs water, and that leads to the better use of uh, rainwater as well as irrigated water and eventually also helped Im improve soil health. So that, that's just one example. I was earlier this year in Mexico, visited a sugarcane uh, farming project, met with some of the farmers there. The project was a winner of Monsucre Impact Fund, so a partnership that we've had uh, with a number of other players there. And they were talking again about the use of organic fertilizers uh, and compost for farming and the improvements that had that it had had on yield as well as uh, um, um, overall soil health um, and the expectation that the project will will improve farmer income. So there's lots of connections that we are seeing in broader environmental benefits and social benefits um, through the lens of water. Excellent. And we were just discussing that with Alok as well about the interdependence on climate and how can this practice make farmers be more resilient to the climate change scenario. So perhaps you want to complement with that? Oh, yes. Uh Sure. I mean, just taking forward where Madhu was, Madhu left. And of course, I represent International Water Management Institute, uh, the country representative from, for Delhi, and for India. And as you know that when we are talking about this paddies, and uh, I think there cannot be, a, I saw a number of examples being quoted from India, and because it is rightly so, because about 44% of our area is under rice, and so that really makes a difference. And when we are looking into this kind of a things, the way at EMI we look at it, we look at it more from the perspective of water energy food nexus, as I think another previous speaker was also talking about. Because when we are trying to increase the water use efficiency or trying to look into the agriculture water management, we just can't look at with the lens of just water alone. Because to manage water, you have to see a thing even beyond water, because they are in interconnectivity. So this interconnectedness really leads to the fact that we have to look into this thing. And now with the climate change, so when we are looking into the water management or agriculture water management or water use efficiency or water productivity, is from the point of view of water energy food nexus, but with a climate lens. Now because more often than not, we are talking about water as an adaptation and resilience building, but less on the mitigation. So those are also need, needed to be explored. And that is there. So what Madhu was telling, so yes, we have been working on those kind of an aspects. And uh, as if you try to go into those numbers, I would not bombard with all those numbers. Mm -hmm. Because we know there are well-established practices, like when I was talking about the dark seeded rice, alternate wetting and drying, which is nothing but the intermittent flooding. 
and all these things or the deficit irrigation or the aerobic rice and so on and so forth, those are pretty much required and they are being adopted. I'm not telling that they are not being adopted, they are not being looked into. Of course, the scale is rather less and there are potential benefits, both in terms of water saving, which leads you to enhancing resilience as well as adaptation to climate change, and at the same time, the mitigation. Because if you see the direct seed rise, on an average, you can have a reduction in the GHG emission. I mean, not the GHG, I'm talking about the GWP, global warming potential, which is some total of all these. Mm -hmm. And that's something around 40 to 45 percent. I mean, there's a wide range, in fact, of course, so I'm just giving kind of an average value. And say is the case with, with water saving. Now, that's just one example of DSR, or alternate wetting and drying. And then, of course, now we are talking about drip irrigation in rice. So, of course, I for say would be more than happy to see also to push that because in my previous positions, I've also been working on low energy water application devices for rice. So those are the kind of a, uh, gadgets or those are the kind of the devices and the practices which we really have to look into. And another thing which is really now coming up and it has got a good result is subsurface drip irrigation for even rice. So that has a wider potential even for further water saving as well as the reduction of the global warming potential. So those are the kind of the practices. And I know that as we go forward, I can talk about that, that how things are working and uh, what all is required to be done. But the way I would look at it or we should be looking at it, it is not just look at the water use efficiency in isolation. Mm -hmm. We have to look at it associated with that is the nutrient use efficiency and energy use efficiency. Why I'm telling this thing? Because if you are talking, because look into those geographies which are more vulnerable, where water stress is already there, and groundwater pumping is taking place in most of these areas. So there, it is not just only because the water, but also the energy, because you are pumping a whole lot of water using the energy, which requires both the diesel as well as the electrics. So, when we are doing water saving, you are at the same time saving on energy. <coughs> and so you are reducing directly the mitigation from the source of energy as, as well. So I think that's, there are many, many things which I can share, but I know I'm looking at the time. So maybe I'll come back if required again. Thank you, Alok. That was crystal clear. So water efficiency brings many co-benefits, the most obvious water savings, but also mitigation and adaptation benefits, soil health, improvement in livelihoods of the farmers. So why aren't we doing it at the scale and the speed that we need if it's such a no-brainer and such a win-win, right? And that's where you come in, Richard, with the finance and the innovations on this space to help incentivize that at the speed that we need. Thanks. And, and maybe I can just take a step back and introduce myself again briefly. I'm with the International Finance Corporation and we invest in the private sector. As I was preparing, I was thinking about my role on this panel and, and, and how I came to be here today. And I want to draw some very interesting pieces together. I'm South African, so we have mm -hmm. a very strong South African component here today, and that's by design. I was brought up in India, so I, I understand the, the crop. And I was a farmer before I joined IFC. So I have a technical background, I have a cultural background, and I have a commercial background. I'd like to bring a little bit of all of that in today. Go for it. Um, you know, when I think about farming... Uh, and particularly rice, it's about 8,000, 13,000 years old. It's not just a commercial piece. There's a culture there. There's a landscape there. It's a trusted crop and there are practices. And there are things that have changed in the last 8,000, 13,000 years, but they're not major. If we look at them, we've got varieties that have changed. We've got them to be more saline resistant, drought resistant. We've increased yields. We've got flavor profiles that bring premiums. These are all things and tools that we can work with. But essentially speaking, the culture of rice production has not moved far ahead. Uh, and part of the reason for that is, you know, you've got 150 million odd farmers doing this in rice, and they're all smallholders, mm -hmm. and they're all on very small areas of land. And we sit here talking about financing it, and we've got to think about it at two levels. One at the commercial level, what can we do through large off-takers, such as IFC works with Olam, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, big organizations that have a global footprint. And what can we do with a smallholder farmer? Because to change this, you have to change it at its core. And the, the farmers I work with are business women. 
businessmen. They are not ecologists, they're not environmentalists, they're not climate change specialists. They're trying to make a buck. And when I say trying to make a buck, I mean that quite literally. They're making a dollar fifty a day. And that's for a family. That's tough. And we want them to invest in changing carbon emissions. We're going to have some work cut out for us. We really are. And there are things we can do. We can finance it, but we need to finance it at a couple of different levels. We need to finance the capex, the capital expenditure, the big costs. We need to finance the opex, the operating expenditure, the day-to-day. -day. Rice is an excellent crop in that you can get two to three yields a year. So you've got lots of cash flow. You've got money flowing through the system. But there's not a lot of money. It comes often, but it doesn't come in large amounts. And the money we need to change to go to drip irrigation, for example, which is a technology I like a great deal, is an enormous amount. The amount of money we need to keep the system running, the operating costs, are very, very high. So when we talk about alternate wet and dry, and when we talk about mechanization, when we talk about reducing stubble in the field, these are big costs. Not just today, in terms of buying the equipment, but in the future. And the other thing I want to mention that I want think, people to think about is, if I'm a farmer, do I actually own my land? And if I own my land, do I actually have the rights to my land? These matter when we look at providing finance. Do you have the land title? The World Bank works very hard on land titling. It puts an enormous amount of money into it. You want to change a farmer's point of view? Give them rights to their land. Give them ownership. Give them an asset that they can work with. Give them something that they can use but have confidence in. You also need to be aware that transitional finance is required. We're asking for change. Don't come there with a large check and say, take my money, take my risk. Say, take my money today and I'll ease you into a change. I'm going to give you transitional insurance. I'm going to take some of that risk off the table until you're making the money and you have confidence. Change the culture progressively. Change the finance progressively. There's so much innovation in the way that we, we can finance uh, farmers. But it, it, it's, not, it's not simple. It's not straightforward. But we know what to do. <clears throat> Thank you. I really like how you divided this in the difference between the commercial scale and the smallholder farmers. But perhaps before we jump into another of the speakers, do you have one specific example that has inspired you uh, of, of how this has been adopted in the smallholder farmers where the cultural uh, challenges are harder? Uh, that's a tough question. And, and it wasn't one I was prepared for. So, so, <laughs> so thanks for asking. I mean, I think, you know... I, It, it, it's tough. I'll need to think about that a little bit. I'm, I, I wasn't prepared. I think there are many examples I have of being inspired by farmers. Um, and many of them come from India, interestingly enough, because I've spent so much of my, my, my time in the field there. Um, and, and seeing farmers adopt change, um, I think the biggest one that I've seen come through in India has, has been the adoption of drip irrigation uh, and the way that's gone forward. Uh, and I want to mention that specifically because it's been... It's been something that a huge amount of effort has gone into, both from the private sector to create access to the equipment and, and, and uh, the right f formulations of equipment, but also from the government to support it. So I think when you talk about uh, inspiring examples, I think they come where I see uh, a technology that makes sense, that can increase profitability, is supported in its transitional period by the government and is made available and a lot of resources are put in. Investment is made by the private sector. So I, I think I would say seeing drip irrigation and the change that it can make and seeing what it can do for farmers in India in the right cases has been probably one of the most inspiring things I've seen. Wonderful. And I second that drip irrigation is really inspiring also for barley farmers. And talking about other crops, Madhu, since we have you here and perhaps you can jump in, um, Do you have any examples on Coca-Cola of how you've seen the transition? Because we've spoken about rice most of the time, but do you have other crops in your portfolio? Perhaps you've seen cultural change through in finance innovation in Coca-Cola supply chain? Yeah, I can actually um, talk about two examples. One from India, which is a, a project that Coca-Cola Foundation and uh, other partners supported, um, which was working with um, sugarcane farmers. It's a pro uh, it's a fruit circular economy project that uh, that we have, and it worked with smallholder sugarcane farmers in India and has been so successful that it's been re replicated across other commodities as well. And what we found was that through using uh, a number of efficient farming techniques, including irrigation, uh, different uh, 
yield, um, high, high density yield crops. We found that um, the overall yield of crops in increased and um, farmer incomes increased. And as a result, you know, the project has now been replicated across multiple states and multiple commodities uh, across India. So that's one. And a recent example also from um, the Coca-Cola Foundation and our bottling partners in Turkey um, in an ap apple growing region where um, it worked, the project worked with smallholder farmers um, and looked at drip irrigation as well as the use of some digital technologies to look at um, soil moisture and climate moisture conditions to develop personalized irrigation plans that helped improve irrigation efficiency. And uh, it's a new project. We're just getting results from the ground. And from everything we're hearing is that there have been yield improvements. So change takes time. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of technology, um, room for digitization. But the understanding of the local context is very different. You know, in, in the US, I was in a corn farm recently that was using drone technologies. And then you go to the developing world. I come from sugarcane, a family of sugarcane farmers in India where the context is very different, just like uh, Richard was mentioning. Um, it's about contextualizing to that particular economy and working with that group of farmers to understand the challenges they face and designing uh, solutions that address their needs and take them on the journey. Can I just come back with one thought? I, I, I took course. a bit of time to reflect on your question about inspiration. And, and one of the things I want to add in here is inspiration you get from farmers who realize a crop they've grown actually has value, a lot more value. Uh, and so I want to give two examples from Africa this time. Uh, one is Fonio, which IFC is now supporting. It's a, it's a small grain crop that's grown in West Africa. It's not considered to be a high value crop at this stage, but in the market in the, the northern uh, part of the part of the world, northern hemisphere, it's actually a very valuable crop. It's considered very valuable. And seeing small farmers who've grown a crop which is climate resilient, which is drought resilient, and now see them turn it from something that, that they consider to be a low value crop to being a high value crop, that's inspirational. Seeing drumstick, which is a, a crop that's used in India, but is known as Moringi in Africa, seeing that turn into a crop that's hugely valuable um, and goes from being something that's pretty much a, a weed on the side of the road to being something that they're exporting is also inspirational. These are drought resilient, climate resilient crops. And so when I think about rice, I also think about what's the alternative? What else could we be growing as we give farmers options that can give them alternative crops to grow. Maybe our way out of some of this uh, carbon emissions is to say, what else can you grow? What else makes sense for you? What else will make you a successful businesswoman? What else will make you a successful businessman? That may be a way out. Don't hammer against a nail that, that's never going to you know, so solve your problem. Try and find alternatives. Thank you, Richard, for those two examples and for that provocation. I think it's very relevant for the context that we're facing. And going back to context and geographies, eh, of course, culture is something that we cannot eh, have it overarching. Every context is specific, but also policies are context specific. So, Alok, why don't you talk about the enabling environment that we need to create from a policy perspective to make these changes? Yeah, that's uh, really very much required because, uh, I mean, if we really want to scale out, we need to have a very conducive policies because the technologies are there, but for scaling out, the policies are pretty much the instrument. And, uh, of course, there are a number of policies which uh, I can quote from India. And uh, uh, very latest f on, in terms of water use efficiency, mm -hmm. the government of India has recently... Uh, established what we call Bureau of Water Use Efficiency. And uh, right now, the task force is looking into the roadmap and the pathways, how the Bureau of Water Use Efficiency works. It's not just only in the agriculture irrigation sector, but all the water-related sectors. And I happen to be the chairman of that task force appointed by Government of India. So that's uh, one major push now the Government of India is giving, trying to give into that direction. And then there are a number of other uh, policy instruments which we have. Uh, one of the oldest policy instruments which we had in pa Punjab, Soil Water Act, where you are trying to delay the rice transplanting by a few days, like up to 10th and 15th of June in Haryana and Punjab. Because the idea is that you save on the high losses of evapotranspiration and you reduce the uh, uh, wastage of groundwater. And so there has been evidence that how it has been really working. 
Now, very latest instruments, policy instruments which are there, both in the Haryana as well as in the Punjab, that's the western part of the country where, you know, a lot of groundwater exploitation and rice is going on. And one is on uh, incentivizing, as I said, incentivization is a must. Because without incentivizing, you just, the way now, right now the things are there, incentivization with certain, it just has to be there. Now, there, the Haryana government has come up with a policy instrument where they incentivize the farmer for diversifying to any other crop from, away from rice, or even in rice by adopting the direct seeded rice. So if you adopt the direct seeded rice, you get incentivized to do that. So that's one of the policy means. That's both in Punjab and Haryana. The another policy instrument where we, from EMI, have been also working with the bank uh, is on direct benefit transfer for electricity. In Punjab, locally they call Pani Bachao Paisa Kamao, means you save water and earn money. Where we looked into those, because in you know, Punjab there's free electricity given. So we looked into that, and you kind of have fixed a reference point looking into the past average value of the consumption of the energy. And then you say that, well, if you, any number of amount units you reduce less than that, use less than that you are consuming, we get incentivize you by directly transferring into your bank account the money equivalent to that. But if you go above that, of course, you are not being penalized. Because otherwise, you know, it becomes difficult at least to begin with. So those are the kind of the few other policy instruments immediately that comes to my mind that I can talk about that. And there are many, many other such uh, places where the policy instruments are taking place. And yes, as I mentioned to you, because any kind of a policy instrument you have, because that's true for any most of the natural resource and particularly the water. Because if I'm a farmer and I'm trying to be very conservatively using gum water, but the next door farmer is sucking all the water, what's the incentive to me? So that is why there has to be incentivization in one way or the other. How it has to be there, that's uh, think can be seen, which could be situation or the context specific. So I think I'll leave it here. So on this point of uh, uh, policy instruments, of course, the other thing which from the mostly going from the finance point of view is that we should be looking into more into the public-private partnership mode, even in the irrigation sector. That is what I have been at least telling for quite some time. I know it's easier said than done, but perhaps there is a need that we really need to look into, and how do we do into that? We have to look into various business models. There are various kinds of business, and that is where the private sector role is very, very important to see, because now, like there are, in India, there are farmer producer organization, FPOs. Mm -hmm. So why can't we federate those FPOs into a situation that they get hand-holding from any corporate or the private sector and become a viable entity. So there are a number of, time is a limitation, otherwise I can have shared many, many such examples and many, many way forwards. Thank you, Alok, and work. congratulations for sharing such an important initiative and providing the example of India. But perhaps, Richard, you can now expand on more the global scale due to your role at IFC. I mean, the, I, in, in terms of the financing specifically? In terms of the policies. Yeah. But in terms, of, in terms of policy, in terms of policy, I think, you know, one of the, the, the things that I mentioned before that I think is particularly important for the World Bank group is around land registry, land mm -hmm. rights. Um, if you don't have strong land rights in place, it's very difficult. Uh, and I've seen cases in Africa and in Asia where farmers are asked to make a change and if they don't own the land or they don't have secure ten tenor of, 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 uh, of use of that land, they're not willing to invest. And so when you talk to a farmer about making a change in rice and they're moving from a flooded system to, for example, the extreme end drip irrigation, there's zero chance a farmer will do that unless they own the land or have a long tenor. The second thing that we need to have is traceability. We need to be able to tell the difference between a low carbon rice, if you will, and a high carbon rice. The example we've just heard of a farmer being incentivized to lower the use of water is fantastic. The incentives there in the lower cost of water, you can give them some money back. But if in the long term you want to differentiate low carbon rice from 
regular carbon, normal carbon rice, if you will, in the market and give a price premium, you need to know where it came from. You need to be able to trace it. So at a government level, you need to have land registry. You need to be able to trace where the, where the, uh, where the, the, uh, the, the rice is coming from. And then the final thing is you need to incentivize not just at a, a corporate level, not just at a carbon credit level, but at a smallholder level through things like rental models. You need mm. to support entrepreneurs, the infrastructure that comes around it. Why I say that, uh, again, I'll come back to the point I made before. If you're making a dollar a day, a dollar fifty a day, two dollars a day, doesn't matter, triple it, three dollars a day, you don't have the money to buy equipment. And you may never have the money to buy equipment. And so if you're going to make changes that are mechanized, if you're going to make changes that require uh, some sort of a capital cost, you may need to pool that. Either you pool that through a cooperative, a farmer, producer organization, which can be supported with subsidies to get equipment, or you do it through rental and service models. So the government can come in and support either individuals, they can support farmer organizations, or they can support and really promote entrepreneurship. And I think that entrepreneurship also has the added advantage that you don't find many 65-year-olds and 55-year-olds going out there and becoming entrepreneurs. Typically, it's the youth. Typically, it's people seeking opportunity. In some cases, it's marginalized people who are coming into a commercial <coughs> environment, such as, such as women, in some environments. So there's a gender positive, there's an age positive aspect of this, and government policy can certainly focus on women and youth. It's certainly an area that we can see some benefit. Excellent. So land registry, traceability and rental models, crystal clear. And I know a lot that you're dying to talk, but we only have 10 minutes left and I do want to open it up for the audience that we have received several questions. So a very quick one. But super short and sweet, sure. promise. Yeah. Yeah, the, another business model, the policy instrument is in the energy sector, solar energy. And where we have demonstrated from IMI in Bihar, in the eastern part, a business model where the local youths are put together. You give them a 7.5 or 10 HP pump along with a solar panel with the buried or distribution pipelines. They become the service, irrigation service provider. So that way you are enhancing the resilience adaptation and the mitigation. Otherwise, they were using all diesel pumps. So mm -hmm. that's one of the uh, uh, good example, which I think. And then, of course, the other example is where, which Imi did, that uh, in the groundwater stressed areas, how you try and use this surplus energy evacuated back into the grid. So farmer gets incentivized for that. So that's an example in the groundwater stressed area. The other example is in the groundwater surplus areas. Thank you very much. Again, the nexus between food production, climate change, yes. and the 360 with incentives. Love it. So we're going to open it up to perhaps one or two questions here. And I know there's other questions um, going on the online format. Perfect. I forgot. <laughs> no, uh, so I'll, I'll ask a slightly provocative question. I asked a question earlier. Is it seems so uh, obvious that uh, de uh, you know shifting to uh, rice, uh, water, less water consuming, rice growing systems, etc. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, but why is the in India, I know we have been involved um, in other countries we are working in. Why does it not scale up at the level, you know, you mentioned there are about, what, 150, 200 million farmers growing rice. Why are these numbers of going, who are not doing these alternative uh, SRI or DSR systems, why are those numbers not crossing millions? There are projects everywhere, they're crossing thousands. Uh, maybe they're crossing 100,000 somewhere. But why are they not going to 10 million, 20 million, 30 million? What is it that is missing to scale up an approach which seems very self-evidently useful for farmers, useful for everybody, but it just there's something missing. What is the missing element preventing the scaling up of this idea? Excellent. So before we go into answering, and hold your thoughts because I'm going to ask each of you to give a short and sweet, like, fast response on the challenge for scale. But before that, we just want to hear a couple of more questions since we're running out of time to make sure that we include other um, questions. So there are some uh, questions from the online audience, one from Johnson Mania. 
What role, for instance, could peer-to-peer -peer learning play in driving collective action among farmers? And then another question also from Louise Parlons Bentata. To what extent is it desirable to capture the biomethane from paddies and use it as a new source of clean power? Is that something in an innovation also that has been thought of? And um, just a few also um, shout outs to Mansi Tripathi who says there Alternatives for paddies could be millets, like the FAO and UN has recognized the International Year of Millets to be in 2023. And Letitia Osborne also mentioned that WW, from WWF that South Africa also works with smallholder farmers there um, on livestock farming to implement water stewardship best practices. Um, and there's a lot of um, um, agreement there on OPEX also should be finally supported to allow farmers uh, to get more profit from implementing pricey methods such as drip irrigation, specifically in commodities such as vegetable, fruit and wine. Well, thank you so much for all those great questions. I feel that we need like another hour of panel to, to answer all of them. But perhaps to start with, do you want each of you give your short and sweet answer of what is the main challenge that we're facing to reach out the scale that everyone is looking for? So, Madhu, if you want to start. Yeah, and I will say um, this is why this is such an important topic that the World Bank has um, and WRG have chosen to address today. I think the role of collective action platforms and really um, showcasing best practice, bringing a number of peers together so they can learn from each other and uh, designing programs that can be scaled up to achieve the large scale impact that we are looking for is so critical. And so I hope to see more of that from WRG and other collective action platforms going forward. So why not scaling? I mean, I think part of the reason is that there isn't yet a, a significant business case. Uh, I was talking to somebody in, in India who was working on this, and they said they'd gone out to market and tested a low-carbon rice versus a high-carbon rice, and there was no price premium. No one wanted to pay more for a rice that looks the same in the packet, tastes the same when it comes out. Uh, and so the, there really isn't an established brand, an established demand that will pay more. And again, <laughs> farmers are businessmen and women they're not going to do something without getting a return. They're not going to increase their risk. So the business case isn't strong enough yet. Um, and I think that that's, that's particularly important. In, in India, where you're subsidizing water, you're subsidizing power, you can play around with those subsidies. But at the end of the day, net-net, you have to come out with more money for a farmer to do this. Um, 150 million farmers producing rice, they're all small. Unless you get it right for them, you're not going to change things. Peer-to-peer -peer learning. Farmers learn from farmers. Fact. They, they don't learn from academics. Fact. I'm not going to trust somebody in a classroom. I had to learn in the field. When I went into farming, I had a degree. Fantastic. Did I learn in those first few months? Oh, yes. Did I learn from other farmers? <coughs> Absolutely. Did I learn from lecturers? No. Was a lot of what I'd learned useful? Yes. But it didn't actually help me to be a farmer. I had to actually go out there and get my boots muddy. So peer-to-peer -peer learning, essential. Biomethane, yes. There's also you know, mushrooms you can grow on rice straw. There's also you know, baling rice straw and using it as part of a, a feed. There are many options out there, <coughs> but they're not, they're not done for 150 million farmers. So maybe some of them could become useful. Some of them could work out. I mean, the problem we have with rice that we've been talking about is methane. So can you take that elsewhere? Yes, but you've got to pick up the rice straw in large volumes. You've got to transport it and you've got to convert it. Infrastructure isn't there yet. Thank you, Richard, and thank you also for answering all other of the questions that were online. So I do appreciate that. And now, Alok, if you want to continue as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll start with an optimistic note. Yes, I mean, a scaling, yeah, it's not to the scale where we would like it to be, but the beginning is already there. So let's look, glass half empty or the full. So as I said, so let's be more optimistic. Yes, it's a slow process. It is going on but the pace has to be increased. In order to do that, there are a number of ways that we have, one has to look into. It's not that it's not happening, but perhaps the pace has to be built up, more of creating awareness among the farmers and others, the capacity building, which is there, but I think it requires to be much more paced up, and the extension services. Because we know that the extension services, where they are. So my own perception is, I've been also uh, in my previous position as a deputy director general natural resource manager, I was also for some time deputy director general Ext agricultural extension with ICAR. That the extension services, the way it should be there, we should try and bring more private sector into that. 
because it can't be just managed by the government. So that's what my personal thinking is. So that's something, of course, various NGOs and the CSR companies, they are already doing there, the foundations, and then the convergence. Because what is happening, there are a number of programs and the policies going on, but there is lack of convergence. Although the convergence mechanism is now being pushed forward, but still it's going to take a lot, a lot of time. And finally, the, as I said earlier, the PPP mode, the business models, farmer collectives, or the collective way of working in a partnership with the private sectors. So that is something really which is required to take it to the scale which is required, because perhaps if we feel that the government alone can take it to the scale, I think that's also perhaps not fair for any one of us to think of that. Not that because I was part of government for more than 37 years, but because that's the kind of the fact it is. Thank and you. Uh, so this is something I, well, I know that looking at the time, so please. Thank you, Alok, and thank you for giving that positive note. I'm a stubborn optimist, so I do think that we need to finalize with a positive note. And thank you to the other room that has been clapping for all of us in yeah. the meantime. So just to finish on a positive note, Madhu and Richard, something very short to keep on inspiring the group of change makers that we have here. Well, um, there's a lot that's been done. There's a body of work that we can learn from, and hopefully that will accelerate the pace of action in the years to come. Yeah, and from my side, I think you know we've we've got we've got many many factors that are that are helping us move in this direction. I, I think people are becoming more aware of the value of of low carbon crops, of organic crops. I think there's a willingness to move there. I just think the market's not yet ready, and that willingness is important. The consumers who buy rice have to be willing to pay a little bit more. Uh, and we've seen many, many examples of where that's been the case. Uh, again, I'll, I'll come back to Fonio. It, a lot more is paid for it. Quinoa that, that came into, into you know, other parts of the world from Latin America, pay, paying a huge amount of money for that now. Um, Moringa, we're paying a lot of money for that as a superfood. Rice is essential. It's an essential crop, uh, and I think that when people look at it and they understand it's only a small amount more they have to pay for low-carbon rice, uh, when they're willing to pay that, when they see that, that, that they're actually benefiting the environment, I think that'll happen. And, and we see a lot of that. I have three young children, and they're very climate conscious. The next generation will be much, much more powerful consumers, much, much more uh, powerful advocates for low-carbon rice. So I think we're, we're on the right track. Thank you so much, and thank you for the enriching conversation. I'm going to turn it over to Mike to close us. Um, and thank you so much for the co-conveners for having us. Thank you. Thank you. We thank the moderator. Thank you. Thanks very much to everyone. we just got a few minutes left. I'm going to just say a few words uh, in closing. Um, but probably the most important thing to do is to thank... Uh, the two moderators to thank the panelists, uh, particularly thanks to uh, the Deputy Minister from South Africa for gracing us with your, your presence and, and thanks for the very rich discussion. These are complex issues. I think one of the key takeaways for me is that no one agency, no one set of uh, stakeholders uh, will be able to solve these alone. These are joined up problems. They also joined up not just to water, as Alok was saying, it's between water and energy and food and climate, and they all, uh, they all come together. We heard that um, of the world's uh, wa fresh water, 70% is used for agriculture, and of that 70%, about a third is used for paddy production. This kind of efficiency measures could save 30% of that paddy production. That is significant, not just for water efficiency, but for climate and for other, um, for other uh, uh, benefits. What's vital is how does the smallholder farmer, the 150 million farmers that grow paddy, to not lose money doing it. And what I heard from Richard is that we're not quite there yet at scale. We don't have the products that are recognized in rice to value that additional benefit. But that seems to be the work, where the work is. And part of that for me is how does the government, how does the private sector, how does the farmer, how do the academics get that market to a point where you can have profitable uh, for, for the smallholder, water efficient rice at scale. So we're not solving it in this session. We're just highlighting some of the issues. I do think there's a lot to chew on, there's a lot to go uh, away with. 
from the World Bank side and from the 2030 WRG, we committed to working with you in these multi-stakeholder platforms at certain uh, countries where you, where you want us. Um, but uh, thank you very much to the audience. Thanks to everyone online. There was rich participation online. We didn't get to all the questions. I'm sure there's lots more we can discuss. But for now, we'll close it there. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day.